that this morning. So now I'd like to introduce you, without further ado, to our, our, our other keynote speaker this morning. I, I've known uh, Sir Mike Lawrence for, for gosh, many, many years, probably I uh, first met him about 10 years ago. Uh, I saw him in Boston last October, mentioned uh, the conference. We were in the early stages of planning at the time and said, would you like to be involved? And he said, yes, on the spot, which was, which was fantastic. So many of you will know Sir Mike as the, uh, until very recently, the chair of, of NICE, the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence. Uh, he retired from that post in April, I think. And uh, he's uh, not resting on his laurels. He's, uh, he's still the president of the Royal Society of Medicine. And he's uh, just recently been appointed as the chair for the, East of, uh, for the Eastern Academic Health Science Network. So, uh, so here in Cambridge, I, I believe and imagine we'll, we'll be seeing a lot of him. So uh, for his insights and uh, his thoughts on the sector, over to Sir Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It's a great pleasure to be here. Now, how do I work this? Um, um, there are many definitions of translational medicine, and I'm taking a, a, a broad uh, definition approach. Uh, and I believe it involves uh, not just bench to bedside phase one and two studies, but expansion of uh, research into larger populations, three and four studies, dissemination uh, and real world effectiveness, and incorporation. Uh, into routine practice. And so I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, the, the, the range of what I see uh, as translational medicine. Translational medicine, of course, is important to patients, to healthcare professionals, uh, for clinical scientists, for the life sciences industries, uh, and, and, uh, and, and the public too, because ultimately they're the ones who benefit. Now, um, the regulatory arrangements uh, that I'm going to be talking about are, include clinical trials authorization, ethics approvals, NHS governance, the first, first three uh, representing what you might call the regulation of clinical research. Uh, and then I'm also going to talk about uh, the pair approval, the, uh, my old world uh, at NICE. Much of what I'm going to talk about in relation to clinical research stems from uh, my experience uh, as chair of the Academy of Medical Sciences uh, Review of Health Research. Uh, it was uh, instigated at the behest of uh, uh, Gordon Brown's government um, um, I was asked to chair it, and uh, we produced our report uh, a year later. Uh, and and uh, I will both quote this and talk about the developments that have occurred afterwards. The clinical trials uh, authorization arrangements uh, uh, are, are under the control, as it were, of the EU Clinical Trials Directive. Uh, including first in studies man, uh, clinical trials of new active substances, clinical trials for new indications. Perversely, though, it also includes any pharmacodynamic or pharmacokinetic studies with established products, any clinical study that involves an additional investigation. Now, um, it's generally regarded that the Clinical Trials Directive is probably uh, the worst uh, and most flawed directive ever produced out of Brussels. Um, and and in, in some respects, it becomes completely absurd. Uh, and it is as irritating uh, to my academic colleagues as it is to the industry. And just let me give you an example. Um, a, a group of pal palliative care doctors wanted to find out whether um, high-dose morphine uh, in, in terminal cancer uh, caused cognitive impairment. Actually quite an important issue, because can they make wills, can they change their wills, and so on. Uh, and, and so because they were using uh, a new instrument, uh, in other words, a questionnaire to assess cognitive function, they were, uh, it, it fell within the scope of the European Clinical Trials Directive. So they had to get uh, ethics approval. Well, that was fair enough. Uh, they had to get GMP certification. Now, they were using ordinary morphine at license, but nevertheless, they still had to get a GMP certificate. Um, they had to be conformity with GCP. That is to say, they had to keep... Uh, the morphine uh, at plus four degrees centigrade in a fridge uh, with a 24-hour with a sensor. Of course, morphine is normally kept at room temperature. There's no need to keep it in a fridge. Uh, and it's an added complication uh, uh, um, because the fridge had to be lockable and screwed to the wall and so on and so forth. Um, they had to be monitored by GCP inspectors and report uh, SUSAs and those sort of things. Uh, and when it came, they had to provide indemnity, indemnity, uh, arrangements, it was going to cost them 4,000 quid. They decided to give up. 
So the clinical trials directive is, is, has been bad news, both for academia as well as for, for life sciences. Um, uh, it lacks clarity, it's implemented inconsistently across the EU, it's disproportionate, as I just indicated, and it has a one-size-fits-all uh, approach. However, the Commission has realised uh, that it's uh, uh, made a, a mistake and uh, it's accepted uh, criticisms, uh, both short-term uh, and long-term, uh, and has produced a draft clinical trials regulation. Uh, this uh, have, have, has a number of features. It's, going to, it's provided it's approved by Parliament and the, uh, and the Council. Uh, it will be a regulation, not a directive, which means there will be uh, consistency across uh, Europe, hopefully. Uh, there are new authorization procedures. It is restricted to clinical trials. Now, the problem with that is that the wording uh, of the directive uh, is unclear, uh, and um, I've been involved with the Academy in trying to make sure that the terminology that's used in the new regulation uh, is consistent uh, and, and is explained. It simplifies safety reporting and it simplifies indemnity arrangements. And it unquestionably is going to be an improvement on what we've had in the past, provided the definitions and the terminology are made very clear, uh, uh, because otherwise, um, as they get translated into various languages, uh, there may well be uh, missense in, uh, in, in the translation. In the United Kingdom, uh, we have uh, a number of years now, uh, generic ethics approval arrangements with the National Research Ethics Service, and generally speaking, um, it, it is regarded as working well uh, and, and in a timely fashion. However, there are also a whole bunch of other ethics uh, um, uh, approvals that are necessary. So that, for example, if the trial involves a, an, an additional X-ray, you have to go to that wonderful uh, Administration of Radioactive Substances Advisory Committee, RSAC as it's known as, uh, to get their approval too. And, and sometimes you have to have uh, three or four of these, and they, run, they tend to run in series rather than in parallel. Uh, and... Uh, 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 um, what the review recommended uh, that I chaired uh, was there'll be a single ethics review, building on the success of the National Research Ethics Service, uh, and, and that this should be uh, um, under the umbrella of a new organisation, the Health Research Authority. And the Health Research Authority was created uh, over a year ago now, and it is bringing together um, all these, uh, most of these uh, uh, research ethics approvals, mechanisms, uh, and I think when it has done so, it will make a very considerable difference to the ethical review and approval. The NHS research governance, the arrangements whereby you have to seek approval from uh, NHS hospital trusts, um, are, 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 are comprise both global checks uh, and um, local checks. The problem is that each trust insists on doing its own global checks. Uh, and so, for example, I met a, a, a lady who had been the principal investigator in a clinical trial involving 61 trusts and had 61 CRB checks. It is completely absurd. Um, now, there is a, a need for local checks, uh, as I indicate here, the availability of local investigators, the availability of relevant patients, pharmacy capability if it's a, uh, if it's a pharmaceutical but it, it is unnecessary for each individual trust to re-examine the patient consent form, which has already been given approval by an ethics committee, uh, and, and want to make additional changes. Uh, and so, um, in the review we undertook, uh, uh, it, it was the major bottleneck in, in, in the UK system. Um, Cancer Research UK estimated at the time I was doing the review uh, that uh, from the day they agreed to, to, to fund a trial, to the day the first patient entered into it, it was a median of 621 days. And it was another 179 days before the last patient entered into it. By the time they got the results, people had rather lost interest in the whole topic. So um, um, what, what we recommended in the review was that the global checks should be done once, uh, and the, study, the local checks should be done uh, within 20 days. And there's more than one way you can do this. You could either get the Health Research Authority to do it, the global checks on behalf of all trusts, or alternatively, you could get one trust to do it on behalf of other trusts. You could have a lead trusting. I really don't mind which it done, provided it's done uh, quickly and efficiently uh, and reliably. So 
Progress to date, uh, clinical trials authorization, a draft regulation has been published uh, and hopefully will come into force uh, uh, in 2016. Seems an awful long time to have to wait, but never mind. Um, the uh, Health Research Authority has been uh, uh, established. It is merging many, uh, but not yet all, uh, specialist ethics bodies. Uh, it's undertaking a feasibility of a single sign-off for NHS approval. And then the third thing, which nothing to do with the recommendations in, 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 in the review I chaired, um, has, I think, very importantly, has been the creation of the Academic Health Science Network. Uh, and as just been mentioned, um, I've been appointed chair of the Eastern Academic Health Science Network, uh, based on the four nodes of Cambridge, Norwich, Colchester and Stevenage, uh, involving all the universities, um, all the hospital trusts, uh, the NHS generally, uh, public health, uh, local government, and of course, critically importantly, life sciences industries. And our agenda is to, uh, is to promote research, encourage recruitment of clinical trials, and to try and uh, 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 ensure proportionate research governance. And uh, um, if necessary, I'm more than willing for the uh, Academic Health Science Network to um, be able to uh, organize, arrange um, um, uh, some sort of single sign-off. Um, the network is also uh, involved in service improvement, reducing avoidable harms, making sure that nice guidance, particularly technology appraisal guidance, is universally adopted within three months of, uh, of its publication. And thirdly, industry engagement, uh, support for research and development, uh, developing local enterprise East, uh, and the Small Business Research Institute, which uh, an initiative uh, which actually um, um, our um, Academic Health Science Network is responsible for implementing uh, for the country as a whole. Now on to payers. Payers have problems. Uh, for nations seeking to provide universal health care, there is increasing demand. Uh, in part because of the demographic challenges, we're all growing older, and as we grow older, we have more and more comorbidities. So by the time uh, Bill and I get to the age of 80, we can expect to have five uh, simultaneous con conditions. Um, lifestyle choices, uh, eating, we're, you know, we're all doing too much eating, drinking, smoking, and having sex with the wrong people. Uh, and, and, and there are public expectations uh, uh, about healthcare. Uh, in particular. And all countries have resource constraints. They all have uh, uh, a finite sums of money to spend on healthcare. This shows the money spent on healthcare uh, across Europe, not just in the EU. And you can see that the amount of money available for healthcare in, uh, spent on healthcare in Albania or Macedonia or Romania is one tenth uh, what it is in Switzerland, Norway or Luxembourg. The reason for this variation is very simple. Countries spend on healthcare what they can afford. There is an extraordinary correspondence between the country's per capita GDP and the per capita spend on healthcare. Amazingly correlation, bearing in mind the differences in which these uh, healthcare systems are funded. As a consequence, um, healthcare systems sometimes have to make tough decisions. Um, sometimes drugs are unaffordable. Um, this just shows uh, the NICE's technology appraisals program. Uh, these are the condition treatment pairs. It's more than the number of appraisals we, 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 we've done. Um, it, it, it's uh, because some appraisals involve one drug for more than one indication, and others are more than uh, are, are several drugs for the for one indication. But of the treatment condition pairs, or condition treatment pairs, 62%, um, two thirds are recommended unconditionally. Um, another 18% recommended conditionally with some restrictions on use, 15% uh, not recommended. And those 15% not recommended are usually because the cost to the healthcare system is not commensurate with the benefits. And you have to remember, um, if we spend money on one group of patients, there is less money to spend on others. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a harsh, gloomy fact that, for example, when NICE said yes to the use of Herceptin in early breast cancer, one primary care trust, in order to fund it, had to close down its palliative serv care services at home. Another one had to close down its diabetic um, eye clinic. So there are there's real problems for healthcare systems. There are potential solutions. At NICE, we established some years ago a scientific advice service to try and, uh, uh, and, 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 and help companies. 
um, in, in their development program. Uh, we have patient access schemes. Um, there's this value-based pricing that the uh, government has got itself trapped into undertaking. I'm not sure what's going to happen about it. Um, and also, I, I'm very keen, uh, and Bill mentioned this a few minutes ago, on reducing the cost of drug development, particularly with adaptive or what some people call progressive licensing. Uh, in progressive licensing, the, uh, the idea is like, goes something like this. There is an experimental phase where uh, the drug is uh, uh, under, uh, uh, the uh, drug or whatever it is, is assessed uh, in a number of studies. Uh, and at the end of around about phase two, you would have initial approval. Then would come an observational phase on the market. And during this observational phase, uh, provided that the... Uh, uh, the effect size uh, was maintained and was uh, uh, confirmed, maybe even improved, you would then get final license. Uh, and, and then during the post-licensing phase, there may be other studies and other indications. This, I believe, and I would hope, uh, would reduce substantially the cost of drug development uh, and thereby uh, reduce substantially uh, the cost uh, to uh, healthcare payers. This scheme will has problems it will only work if the regulatory authorities are change their minds a bit and, uh, uh, and are prepared to accept uh, uh, observational studies. Um, I was once at a meeting of the EMA and a member of the CPMP said she couldn't possibly envisage uh, the EMA ever giving marketing authorization without a randomized control trial. And I said, thank God you weren't around when all contraceptives were introduced. Um, there needs to be a change in companies. Uh, there needs to be ch the, the prescriber behavior. Because during this uh, observational period, uh, prescribers would, would have to conform very precisely to the, uh, to the indications. And there needs to be a compromise with payers uh, over the price um, during this observational phase that uh, can reasonably be expected. So in conclusion, like Bill, I'm an optimist. Uh, although there's general recognition that uh, regulatory arrangements uh, have been suboptimal, I think we're much better placed now to, uh, uh, to, to, to get them more helpful, uh, not just for life science industries, but my academic colleagues, for patients and the public more generally. And I think uh, leaner product development paradigms like uh, adaptive licensing are, 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 are needed. But new products can only command premium prices if they provide real value for patients. And payers and providers should embrace innovations that provide this real added value uh, for patients. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, and I think Bill and I are going to answer some questions uh, if you want to ask us. Thank you. So yes, when you two get two SIRs together, they decide what they want to do, which is great. <laughs> so uh, we've got the opportunity for, uh, for some, uh, some questions for, for both of them, which is uh, a splendid panel. So over to the audience. Yes, John. Uh, yeah, John Elvin, Medimune. Um, I'd like to ask Mike Rollins, how realistic is the adaptive licensing um, going to become in effect? How, is what, that, sorry. how realistic is that going to happen? Well, there's a lot of enthusiasm for it. Um, uh, um, and uh, my understanding is that it doesn't need a change in, 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 in uh, any legal change. It could be done under, under, the, uh, under the conditional licensing arrangements. Um, I, I, there's a lot of talk about it. I mean, I think it won't work for everything, obviously, but, um, but I think there are you know, people are hunting around a, a brave pharmaceutical company uh, who volunteer their product to try it out first. Did you want to come back on that? <laughs> You're smiling. That's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? One up it's your only opportunity. So William's only going to be here till probably about uh, half twelve when he's finished chairing his panel. So, any other? There's one the gentleman. Ah, I can't see it. Could you identify yourself, sir? So when you Hello, yes, Nathan Nagel. It's an open question. As a snapshot now, what would you say the competitive advantages of the UK for translational medicine? Do you want to start, or am I going to start? Um, you start. OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, um, I mean, as Bill has already indicated, we have superb basic scientists. Um, we have superb clinical scientists. 
Um, and you know, we, we do clinical trials in Britain, uh, academic ones, uh, brilliant, you know, people like Rory Collins in Oxford, um, um, and, and smaller ones. Um, uh, we have a cohort of patients uh, in the National Health Service, which uh, is a sort of substrate, as it were. I mean, it sounds not perhaps the right word, but for, for clinical research. Um, and, and there's increasing enthusiasm. There, there was a time when hospital managers used to think clinical research was a bit, uh, you know, got in the way of seeing, putting new hips in and things like that and seeing outpatients. But, but I think that's changed now, and, and they recognise um, the value um, to, to them, not in monetary terms, but in reputational terms. And they also rep recognise now um, that, that, um, that they have an obligation to future patients as well, as well as the present ones. So that's me for starters. So Bill? I think um, uh, the platforms we have in both genomics and in neurological science are outstanding. I had uh, 56 scientists from the Southern Cluster come for a day and a half to the Wellcome Trust to present to one pharmaceutical firm who I wanted to re-engage, the UK. Um, the proposal now is that there is a partnership between four pharmaceutical firms and that cluster. And that cluster is also expanded because of other work that's going on into Cardiff uh, and into York. So uh, the firm that I went for was J&J. &J. I don't know if the Janssen's here today. And uh, after a day and a half where all the neurologists stayed, I said, you must stay for a year and a half. You're going to a day and a half, not a year and a half. You're going to learn from one another. Uh, Jane Jay summarized it by saying outstanding. Um, part of what Wellcome has been able to facilitate through its strategic award are to create these partnerships of meritocracy. Uh, and in this case, very much underpinned by uh, the genotyping, uh, the neurological science area is uh, truly impressive. Now, I, I did, uh, uh, as a much younger manager, I had responsibility to get Lamotrigine licensed. Uh, in those days, you couldn't get anyone to do uh, trials in Europe. I had to go to the communist Soviet system because no one would consider going for a second-line agent. And now to see Lamotrigine as frontline is very effective. I believe that the ability now to work in partnership. I mean, you know, we talk, uh, those of us responsible for administration of large sums of money are talking regularly, the partnerships between the MRC, the Wellcome Trust, CRUK, uh, uh, the Department of Health are really facilitating opportunities. So uh, I think the climate is dramatically improved. I think we have some basic platforms here that are exciting. The fashion has changed. I think that the way that Andrew Whitty and Patrick Valance are leading GSK is phenomenal for us. We no longer go up the silos to make decisions. Uh, we devolve the responsibility to a small team that are led by, all, by biology and supported by the critical functions. So, I mean, I, I just, uh, I, maybe it's because I see too much of it, but I'm terribly excited by the opportunity. And we have to keep pushing and make sure that this partnership works, that we bring in the adaptive licensing and that we use the strength of the clinical research that is unquestionably there. Uh, look at Stephen O'Reilly and his leadership yep. in yep. Met met metabolism. And we have great research capabilities in this country. So I think we have all, I mean, I can't think of any places where I see so many levers and a fun place to live. And you even get sunshine now, which you know, <laughs> has to be good news. Not tomorrow, it'll be gone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Someone you. else? Yeah, big questions. Hi. Um, Miles Carroll from Public Health England, Port and Down. Do you think, uh, either of you, that the, uh, the likes of the Wellcome Trust and the Medical Research Council actually dedicate enough of their resources to transla translational research? research? Are they still um, dedicated to getting that 12% uh, of citations on basic research? Well, I, I can talk about the Wellcome Trust and... Uh, um, Last year, uh, we went to that uh, rather unusual place called Critchley Hall. I was told it was to help with the rental income. And uh, we had a three-day retreat, and at the end I said, right, governors, you can all be diplomatic. We can, we can be democratic when we vote for the future. When we come to cut things, you need to be autocratic because you never get agreement across a group of people on cutting. But when you say, this is our new policy, so I say, get one vote. So I had 13 votes for translation. 
and three of them putting a subset of human sustainability within that vote. So there's no question that we are every day focusing on how we can pull the levers that help translation, uh, whether it's the built environment, whether it's the clinical environment, whether it's working in partnerships. And you know, I hope that we can demonstrate that economic regeneration. I didn't mention today, we've created, a, you're probably aware of it, Sincona, which is a wholly owned venture capital arm of the Wellcome Trust. Uh, they've done two transactions so far. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased to say they have an income stream from one of the transactions, and the other transaction is working with Great Science uh, in London, which is doing, uh, which is uh, Lente genes and, and genetic cassettes putting sight back into kids that have a gene defect, which is great. And so, you know, to have the ability to be not only the funder of great research, to emphasize through technology translation, to be able to deal with the built environment, and I think you'll find us doing more Stevenage biocatalysts. And at the other end, uh, you know, through strategic awards, managing to push more at the clinical end, which we're doing, hopefully we can contribute in a meaningful way, not only to unmet clinical need, but also economic prosperity. Thank you. Mike, did you have any comments? On? No, I, I think Bill, we had left. So just all. <laughs> OK. Yes, Andy, at the front, and then I'll come to Mark. Yeah, Andy first. Yeah. Uh, Sir William, perhaps because you're going to leave us shortly, can, can I ask you a question directly? For those people in the audience that perhaps don't have the connections or the net, network experience or maybe the confidence, what's the one important thing that they should do um, that would help them to stack the odds in favour of their success of securing these strategic partnerships? I just think you've got to be bold with your requests. So, you know, the phoning of the British Embassy, I mean, you may think well, it was a very odd story, but it was absolutely critical because it gave me the confidence to go to the welcome board and said, I know what's happening in the USA, and I believe we can have a shot at it. Now, if I hadn't have done that, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't have gone into managing R&D. They would never have entrusted it to me. I would be a bookkeeper somewhere still. So, you know, you've got to be bold. And you've got to go knock on the doors, knock on Mike's door, and say, Mike, I really want you to help me. I really need to crack the clinical, the clinical approvals and the adaptive licensing. I mean, I see... I must have 10 people a week come through my office who I've never met before, who come in for advice. And that's our job. You know, as long as we have the time to do it, it's our job to help people. So be bold. Don't be shy. Go up there and ask and make sure that you have the right partnerships to succeed. And when you have great science in a narrow area, go and share it with others. I sat down the other day at a, uh, a petrol head meeting at Goodwood. Don't usually go. And I had uh, a man running a satellite company and the chief executive of Aston Martin Cars. The discussion we had about how they could put their technologies together to better monitor the human being was just amazing. So you can guess where I'm going now. And I'm also, you know, I work with microprocessors. So I'm uh, on arm there saying to me, we really want to go into the body bill. And here's a microprocessor that is thinner than a human hair. And the amount of energy it needs can work off the heat, body heat. So you don't need a battery. And they say to me, Bill, we don't want to do any more in supermarkets. We want to join you in the human body. So I say, you're on. You're in. God knows where that's going to finish. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sir Bill. Thank you. So seize the day is the message there. Mark. I suppose the question before kind of covered a little bit of what I was going to say. My name is Mark. I'm from a startup called Genix. And um, I was just wondering where your opinions lie with the roles of startups, SMEs, in this kind of bringing trans translational research to the forefront. Do you think we should be looking at the big corporations or maybe looking a bit smaller? And also, for the smaller organisations, what kind of routes in would you recommend? So I suppose that's kind of going on there. Let me go first then, Mike. I mean, uh, my whole life I've had incredible advisors. I always try to appoint people that were much brighter than, than I've been, and I've had at least seven mentors through my career. We need to help you incubate. So when, I don't know, you know, you, you can't say we go to the large corporation, you go to the SME. What we do need to do is incubate you. So if you go to Stevenage, we incubate you. We're going to give you HR support. We're going to give you scientific support. We're going to give you financial support. We're going to give you leadership support. So people like me who've had the fun of a great career 
need to return what we've learned when it's appropriate to you and help you. So incubation is key. And you need to find a network that you feel has the domain experience that can help your particular company on the journey you want to go. And there are lots of domains out there. Yeah, and the, uh, uh, and the Stevenage uh, uh, is, part of, is, is within the Eastern Academic Higher Science Network, so you don't need to go any further. <laughs> and, and the next meeting at Stevenage is going to be run by Mike's team. <laughs> I challenged them at a meeting there about a month ago. I said, fine, you're in charge next time. I'm stepping down. You're going to run it. <laughs> it's all very incestuous. Well, that brings the session to... I'd love to a big thank you to you both for, for your time. And I know you're both here for the, for the morning, so do, uh, do nobble them when you can over, over coffee and the, uh, and the refreshments. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mike and Sir Thank you. Thank you.